Hi folks, a content warning that this episode talks about sexual abuse, so please be mindful of that as you're listening today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here. This is Ashwini Prasad, your host of the Inclusive Storytelling Podcast. If you're liking these episodes, please leave a review, download, comment if you're on YouTube, and share these episodes. Feel free to connect with me at theinclusivescreenwriter.com or on Twitter and Instagram at The Inclusive Screenwriter. In addition to being an anti-racism and anti-oppression educator, I'm a screenwriter, self-published author, and of course a podcast host. So if I can make our media more inclusive with you, feel free to reach out. All right, let's jump into our episode. Hi everyone, welcome to the Inclusive Storytelling Podcast. I'm your host, Ashwini Prasad, and here today I'm with my friend, Marie Gettle Gilmartin. Hi Marie, how are you? Hi Ash, it's great to see you again. Yeah, nice to nice. I, I'm, it's always nice to interview friends, and I get to do that more than other folks. So I think that's that's a lot of fun. I, I always do this. I always have my guests introduce who they are because they know themselves better than I could ever give them justice. So let let our audience know who you are and who we're going to be discussing today. Yes, I am the founder and the owner of Fertile Ground Communications, and. I help companies and other organizations transform boring language into something that people want to read that actually is accessible and reader friendly. And often I work with really technical content um, and I try to make that accessible to the readers and something that people really like to read. Awesome. Awesome. And my, well, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you my, my person that I'm going to be discussing today, <laughs> Marley Matlin. Awesome. And you are another person who is going to talk about somebody who's still living. So this is always a lot of fun <laughs> when you're able to talk about somebody who's living. So remind us about who this person is, just in case, because this name might be familiar. People might not be able to place it yet. Yes, Marley Matlin is probably the most famous deaf actor. Um, she is 56 years old and she was... Uh, she she became deaf when she was only 18 months old. Uh, and so she recently become, became even more famous because she was in the, the uh, Oscar winning movie Coda. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, why did you choose Marley? Oh, there's so many. I mean, it's such a big question. <laughs> there's so many. There's so many right, people. Let's do it. From, right? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, uh, yeah, there's so many. Uh, people who deserve recognition by having, you know, by having attention, having a bio or a, you know, biopic. Uh, but I saw an interview and I'm trying to remember, was it, I don't remember what, what talk show it was, but it was the cast of CODA that were being interviewed. The, the guy who won Troy Kotzer, I'm not sure if I'm saying mm -hmm. his name right. Mm -hmm. He was the only, the second deaf actor to win an Oscar since Marley Matlin won hers, which was only 21 years ago, 21 years old. Right. So that was 36 years ago. And finally, another deaf actor is getting this recognition. And they were talking about how, uh, you know, deaf theater is, has, is, some, is a thing, right? And, and there's the, the regular theater and film community doesn't often intersect with the deaf theater, um, the deaf theater community. So, uh, that, so it just really struck me that we don't give enough attention to to that kind of uh, that kind of theater, and then the other piece of piece of that is that I am hearing disabled. I have I wear a hearing aid, and uh, it's because I had this weird, freaky thing called a cholesteatoma about ten years ago that um, has affected my hearing. And my father also is pretty significantly hearing disabled as well. So even though we're not deaf, I have um, uh, I feel like I can resonate a little bit more with people who are who are completely deaf uh, than I would have before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want definitely want to dig into some of the highlights of Marley's life and the things that maybe we don't know. My colleague, he was the first guest for season two of this, of this podcast, and he was telling me about uh, Pat Morietta, and uh, we know him of uh, Karate Kid fame. But he was uh, reminding me that he was a stand-up comedian, and he was also noting that uh, Pat struggled with alcohols, alcoholism most of his life, and that was something. I'd not known about him. So I'm curious to know about Marley's life and the little nuances that make her, I mean, she is so special, but make her even more special that uh, you could share with our, uh, with our audience. She was born in Illinois, Morton Grove, Illinois, 
and she, her parents were both hearing, are both hearing uh, adults, and she lost all of the hearing in her right ear and 80% of the hearing in her left ear when she was 18 months old because of illness and fevers. Although apparently in her autobiography, she, she posits that it may be a gen genetically malformed cochlea that could be part of it. So it's, they may not know exactly why she lost her hearing. She's also reformed Jewish and she attended a synagogue for the deaf, which I didn't even know there, there were such things. Amazing. So, yeah. So she actually planned a career in criminal justice. And part of why she, I'm guessing maybe why, is that she was molested twice. Once by a babysitter when she was 11, and then uh, once by a teacher. So that may be why she was interested in pursuing that. But she actually had her stage debut at age seven. She was Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz at the um, an International Center on Deafness and the Arts Children's Theater production. And she performed through this um, organization throughout her childhood. And then she was actually discovered by Henry Winkler, the Fawns. Oh, from Happy Days. Happy Days, where Happy Pat Morita, right? there yes. we go, it just and, went full circle. Yes, and that is how she got the, the, the position of With Children for a Lesser God, which was from 1986, where she won her first Oscar and really got huge acclaim. I mean, people were so impressed with her and she, so far she's won an Oscar, a Golden Globe, a SAG award, and then nominations for a BAFTA and then four primetime Emmy awards. So she's uh, been nominated and has received a lot of awards. So she's also a novelist. She's written two uh, novels that are based on her own, own life. The first one's called Deaf Child Crossing. It was written in 2002. She has an autobiography called All Scream Later. She, like Pat Marina, also had struggled with drug abuse. Mm. And I think has been, you know, sober for, for many, many years now. But um, she's very active um, as an advocate for the deaf community and has received a lot of awards for that. And in recent years, well, ever since uh, Children of a Lesser God, she has really focused mostly on television because there haven't been a lot of film opportunities, significant film roles for, for um, deaf actors. And it's interesting in that interview where I saw the cast be interviewed, um, they were talking about how, you know, she's basically, she sort of epitomizes deaf actors. She's the most famous deaf actor. And they were talking about how there are so many other deaf actors out there. Yeah. But, you know, she's the one who usually, you know, I don't know if she necessarily gets the jobs, but she's she's the one who people, you know, people first think of. So yes. such yeah. a big world, you know, beyond beyond her. So the other really interesting thing I found out was about Coda, which if you have not seen Coda, you should see it. Yeah. It's an excellent movie. And, and it's about Coda means, uh, which I didn't realize this when I first saw the movie, Coda stands for child of a deaf adult. And uh, it's about a young woman who wants to be a singer. She's the only uh, non-deaf person in her family. And it's set in a Massachusetts fishing community. And it's all about music and about being a coda. And, and as you mentioned, it's not, it's not perfect. I, I read that there's uh, mixed reactions from the deaf community to this movie, but it's a beautiful film. It's really wonderful. And, and the best thing about it is the representation that mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, you know, the, the majority of the cast is deaf. And the other really interesting thing is that um, the, the woman who wrote and produced, wrote, wrote and, and directed the film, she actually, Sean Hader is her name. And she really immersed herself in deaf culture and learned sign language as she was writing the script and she hired interpreters, but the financiers did not want to hire deaf actors. They wanted, they wanted Marley Matlin, but then they wanted to have hearing actors and Marley Matlin threatened to walk out. She said, I'm not doing this film unless you hire deaf actors. So, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that was really, and she knew Troy Kotzer from Deaf West Theater in LA. Mm -hmm. um, so, he was brilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, Troy is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, just 
uh, you've talked so much. I, I want to dig in a little deeper. Yeah. You, so, uh, I mean, there's so much. Uh, I, and I remember Marley from from that movie, Children of a Lesser God. And uh, and now, like, I've thought about that name for a really long time, that movie name. I'm like, hmm, OK, it lots to unpack there. It's an interesting history that I would love to learn more about. But I remember that's the first time I saw her. And it is only one of the few times I've actually really seen a deaf or hard of hearing person play a deaf or hard of hearing person uh, like you said there's tons of people who have played um a deaf or hard of hearing talent or characters but they themselves are not part of that community and it changes the way uh, i remember learning in the in children of a lesser god like uh, that in the, the character uh, marley's character in that movie she can feel the music like literally feel it like a heartbeat and uh, William Hurt I believe was in that movie as well and was her partner and, and unfortunately William Hurt I know he's passed away um, but Marley um, had an abusive relationship with him and she's been very candid about that and um, but I remember it's still a really significant memory for me I was seven when that a movie came out and I still remember it but the lack of has been a lot in terms of um, talent. And it's obviously they can. And what you said really I can talk about, I want to move into theater of what you were saying about um, Marley's uh, growing up and it's horrific. I didn't know about uh, the abuse that she suffered. And it makes me sad because I, I, I'm not an expert, but it makes me think about exploitation uh, of various people. Uh, and maybe because she was uh, deaf or hard of hearing that somehow that played into uh, people being, uh, you know, abusing her, which is absolute nonsense. Uh, I am glad that she found a space for her to to express herself. And I like what you said. Uh, I like it in terms of awareness. I don't like that it happens of uh, that there being a whole theater community that is and it's big around talent that is hard of hearing or deaf, but it's not considered mainstream and they're not partnering with uh, different theater groups around, you know, all around the world. So it makes me wonder how they were created, the offshoot. And if you don't have an answer, it's totally fine. I'm kind of just rambling right now of, the, you know, the lack of community that's happening uh, within the theater groups if they're not including deaf or hard of hearing actors because those groups exist. Yeah, you know, it, it also, I, when I was doing a little research this morning, I stumbled across an article and I don't know if it was by a deaf, it might've been by a deaf person or an advocate. And it was talking about um, doing productions and having people who can hear play deaf, deaf, play deaf characters. And I, it reminded me of when my, I'm not sure what, my son went to Edison, which is on the campus of Jesuit here in Portland, and they have an incredible theater. Um, incredible theater uh, program. But I think it might have been before he was actually there, they did Children of the Lesser God. And, oh, wow. Edison, and Edison has this great ASL program, all the kids learn ASL. And uh, so they had the, the, the uh, ASL teacher, who I think is partnered to someone who's deaf, um, come in and teach the kids ASL. So all of the actors were not deaf actors, they were regular students. And this article that I came across is like, don't ever do that. Don't because, do that. Don't do that because you know, first of all, it and I and I think this was many years ago, and I just think that, that we are learning so much more about representation. And I just like, you know, why would you do that? You, I mean, well, they wanted to give the students a chance, obviously, but why do sort of a lesser? I just. It's Why that so one? I mean, there's so many yeah, other plays I mean, yes. to choose from. I mean, and it was amazing that they learned sign language. It was amazing what they did with it. But if you, I mean, if you were a deaf person and came to that, I was like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Just, I know? think you can learn about it, appreciate it. I mean, I think there's so many moments, but uh, the fact that you're literally missing the point of the of the play <laughs> and the, the people that are are like you said represented in it uh that's a, that's a definitely a huge conversation piece and and especially when we're not seeing as much as many people as we should uh because you know the deaf and hard of hearing community they're a huge part and i'm i'm doing that i'm not going to the nuances right because you meet one deaf or hard of hearing person you've met one 
<laughs> deaf or hard of hearing person, period. Uh, yeah. um, but there is there should be uh, so much more recognition and and definitely i would yeah if i was deaf or hard of hearing and then i saw somebody do children of a lesser god uh and it was played by all hearing talent uh, that would be upsetting that like uh -huh. we didn't reach out or uh, right. we teach asl but we're not accommodating to students who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing, you know, and like you said, I know times are changing, but exactly. Like, yeah, how can it's, we, it's really a missed change. opportunity. Yeah. And the great thing yeah. about that ASL program was, I mean, when my son took ASL, they had to actually go to um, deaf events in the Portland area, in the Portland area and, you know, and mingle with the community. And so I know that the teacher, the ASL teacher was just coming in to help, but he probably had connections that, you know, if you really want to do that play, it's, it's yeah. It's always, it's always offered like in theater when um, in middle school or high school, when they do, I, I remember when my, when my kids middle school did hairspray and my, mm -hmm. my kids and I were like, how are they going to, do they, I mean, because are there enough black actors in the school to do this? Right. Like, what are they going to do? Unfortunately, that's the conversation. Yeah. But, but they were able to find them and they, they actually did an excellent job of it, but it's, it's always kind of like, oh my God, what are they doing? You know? <laughs> And yeah, and the thing is, is like, oh my gosh, are they going to do it justice? Oh, please let them do it justice. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know. I was really pleased in the end with how they did it. But yeah. Um, yeah. If, if they had yeah. done it 20 years ago, it probably would have, who knows what, I don't know. Oh gosh, I'm, yeah, I'm, who I'm, knows? I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So yeah, no, it is. It's it is definitely interesting. Well, I'm I uh, I'm glad that there's definitely much more awareness than we've had in the past, and and uh, it's it's really just wonderful learning about Marley's story and and you know being able to be in spaces where uh, we know what she's been doing and and what's what's also fascinating is at this young age is that she was doing the work and of course Children of a Lesser God came at such a young age. I mean, 21. Uh, but the thing is, is like what you were saying before right the lack of this understanding in this community that she becomes the one for so so long and we know she's not the one yeah. she's not the only person that's out there and what i've heard from people in the in the entertainment industry and this is where i do have an issue is people will say well you know you need that a-list actor right to be in your uh, movie or TV series so you can get people to come in and that's and that's fine and i understand that the thing that I have an issue with is, well, who have we been promoting where they have the people who will come and watch their show or definitely uh, go and spend time and their money in the movie theater? Who have we been uplifting for uh, decades and who have we not? Because it's not like Marley's the only one, but right. she becomes the only one. And then people will say, oh, well, we can't find uh, deaf or hard of hearing. So we're gonna have this so-and-so come and play this uh, for the movie. And it's like, well, it just becomes the same circle. You're, you don't uplift the same, these different groups and people that are there, even though they exist. And then you say, you can't find them or there's only one, and there's only one person who can only do so much, let alone the conversation about, are we even sourcing content where we have deaf and hard of hearing talent so that we can have that representation on screen? Right, I've been really glad to see, do you ever watch the show New Amsterdam? Yeah, I've seen a couple of episodes yeah. early then, on, early yeah. on. Yeah, so in, I guess this is the last couple of seasons, they have a regular deaf actor. Um, who's a who's a, a big wig, you know, she's and she's a I can't remember what she directs, what department she directs, but she's a, you know, she's a, a central character. And she has a, an interpreter with her at all times. And it's great because it's totally integrating this character. It's like normalizing it, you know. So. Yes. Oh, how wonderful. I didn't realize that. That is so great. You know, you remind me when you said that you remind me of um, when you talk about interpreters, uh, I remember it got a little upset. Uh, I, I love uh, Tom Howland. I, I like the Spider-Man movie, so nothing about them, but there's a, a, a missed opportunity, like you said. So uh, my understanding is that there's times where when Tom Holland wears his mask in the Marvel movies, he can't hear. And yeah. so he has somebody who gives him cues. And I... I remember I heard that and I remember being upset 
because I was like, well, if you're going to do that for Tom Holland, when you purposely have him in this uh, suit and playing in character where his ears and eyes and everything are covered, why couldn't you give that same grace to deaf and hard of hearing actors for their cues so that they uh, so that there would be no barriers or very little barriers when they're on set. Yeah, I remember just being like, so you'll give uh, Tom Holland and, you know, you'll think about it in those situations. Yeah. When that talent is not able to uh, hear and you'll make those accommodations super easy and you should, right, huh? for uh, his safety. Um, but it was, I remember being like, okay, so why can't we have that same conversation for our deaf and hard of hearing, our blind, other type of talent so that they can be in front of the camera? Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. And like the Oscars, I don't know how, I don't know how many of these big events or uh, big productions in California actually have an interpreter on site. Yes. So I'm sure that, you know, they were, they probably had one there this, this season, but do they do, do they do that regularly? I don't know. Exactly. And will they continue? Because that would be very inclusive and not just because you, you know, uh, what, uh, what is it 26 years later you have a nominee uh, that is deaf or hard of hearing yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. and one of absolutely. the things I loved about CODA you know when you just have one deaf actor with everybody who is a, or a hearing cast there's not the as much of an engagement you know I mean just the what I love about ASL we, I, I was talking about this with my family yesterday because my 15 year old is also taking AS, ASL right now and uh, what I love about ASL is the, the expressions in the face. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a part of the language. And, and mm -hmm. my oldest and my youngest sons were talking about how the, you don't say like, all, if you compare, if you say a sentence in English, you don't say all the words in ASL. You don't have to say all the words because a lot of it's in your face, your facial expressions. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting. In CODA, you see the way that they communicate with each other that is so much richer <laughs> than if it's just, you know, one deaf person or, or an interpreter communicating. Yes. You know, it's like, yes. it was, yeah, it was really beautiful. And it was, yeah, it was, it was normalized because they were, you know, doing, going about their day-to-day -day business, you know? Yep. Uh, yep. You know, and having, you know, having lots of sex and embarrassing their children and things like that, you know? Um, Normal things. Yeah. 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 Uh, you remind me, my friend who's uh, deaf was, I remember I made a comment about a deaf, uh, no, it was a person, a hearing person playing a uh, deaf person. And I remember being like, oh, I, th I thought they did a good job. And my friend was like, uh, and I was like, okay, teach me, teach me a moment. And it's exact, and they were gracious enough to teach me uh, is that exactly what you said. She was like, you know, I could, I, as a somebody who was deaf, I could immediately tell that person was not deaf and it's she's like it was in the way they moved it's in the way exactly right how they speak it's in how you can carry a conversation with your face and how you use your face to express words and i was like yep yep that makes absolute all the sense and and would you know in my mind would code have been as good if you had people who were trying to fake it or maybe like you said they know ASL but you know who knows how long you've been interpreting or and, and just because you know ASL doesn't mean you're an interpreter that's a whole other thing you're somebody who's learning then you may know ASL maybe you knew it fluently then you're an interpreter which and you can't be, know ASL and be an interpreter and then you have somebody who uses ASL because they're deaf or hard of hearing there's so much right and there's all many new nuances in there and it can't be captured I, I firmly believe it cannot be captured by somebody who is hearing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even just not, this is not the same, but I sometimes when you, um, when I am watching a British show and they have somebody who's trying, who's British, who's trying to be American. That's something yeah, you can tell. Some actors can do that exceptionally well, you know? Absolutely. Some of them are fantastic and you would, like there's somebody, there's, oh, 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 the, do you, have you ever watched The Americans? Matthew Reese is the actor. I have not he seen was, the Americans. He no, brother, he was also in Brothers and Sisters, and he okay. is this Welsh actor. I loved this. I love this actor. He um, was in Brothers and Sisters, which I loved, and now now in, in the Americans, which is an old TV show from I don't know, like five five to ten years ago, where that he's a Russian spy. He's a he's mm -hmm. a like a sleeper spy. 
but he has an exceptional American accent, so good that I never, I, when I saw him, you know, speaking in this natural Welsh accent, I was like, oh my God. Ah, in, general, <laughs> in general, often they do it really badly. So I can only- Yeah, you can tell, it. yeah. It's just a fraction. <laughs> it's not the same as a deaf, as a, a non-deaf person, but you know, yeah. You know. Yeah, I get the analogy, right? I, I totally get the analogy. You can tell, yeah, it, and it's true. Some people can fool me for, for a while and, and, and some people are great. And every once in a while, I'll catch somebody say something and like, I'm like, oh, okay, wait. And then I'll go look them up. And I'm like, oh yeah, they, they're Australian. Yeah. <laughs> and beyond, from- I mean, even with, even beyond that though, what is really a tragedy is the missed opportunity for representation. And yes. oh, you know, yes. it's just, it's, it's, yeah, yeah we, t- we've talked about that before. It's like, and yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm watching, my husband and I are watching this show called The Fosters. Have you mm-hmm. ever heard of the Fosters? I have, yeah. And it's like this major soap opera with all these teenagers. But we're really, we're really hooked on it. And, and there's, these it. Two, there's these two lesbian moms. Well, they're both played by straight actors, right. which is really interesting. You know, it's like, why didn't they choose, you know, queer folks to play those roles? I don't why know. not? Yeah. I know. It just makes yep. me well it upsets me because what I hear time and time again and this is to my earlier point about having um, an A-list person tied to um, mainly movies but also TV shows so people will watch is uh, people will say things like oh well one thing oh one we couldn't find somebody or two the be- the part went to the best person for the role and it always seems to be the white cis person who was the best for the role time and time again. And I'm like, really? Um, it, you know, like, are you sure? Because I'm seeing some unconscious bias here in regards to who you think <laughs> is the best for the role. That sounds exactly like corporate. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, we can't find any engineers of color. We have to hire the best person. <laughs> you, would you would know. You would know. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's not a pipeline issue and for a very long time I thought it was a pipeline issue and it's not it's not a pipeline issue of course there's many more uh, Marley Martins it's just like we haven't moved towards getting that type of representation we we've chosen to save costs and not having an interpreter not having somebody there on set to support them in the ways that they would need and we also have chosen not to have those stories. And we, I mean, as a collective, I'm not saying you and I or, or anybody who's listening. Uh-huh. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's time. I mean, it's time. And I hope that we can ride the wave of CODA success and that there is actually an audience and people are interested. And you can see the beauty, like you said, in the way that they interact and that they're human beings doing their thing. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really hopeful. And I absolutely adore Marley and, and um, Troy. I absolutely adore him. He is absolutely fantastic. And he was getting so much press two months ago. And I, I hope it continues with his win and then also the work that he does because he is so funny and such a lively character. I absolutely love watching interviews with him. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. I sh- I'm going to go look him up and see what's what's next for him. Cause I, I do yeah. hope that he's got more opportunities. Yeah. I I'm really hopeful. And, you know, speaking of the things that Marley has been in, I watched the show I, and, and it was, it was a pretty good show. It was a ma- magicians. It was on Netflix. I don't know if you're familiar with the magicians, but uh, she was uh, on there and she played a deaf, a deaf character, which I thought was fantastic. Cause I remember I saw her on the screen. And I was like, oh, like my heart leapt. I was like, Oh, thank goodness. And it was great to see her. And she was only on there for uh, several episodes, but it was enough for, for me. I was like, I was like, so happy and what was interesting what they did and I I think it was done well is that they actually did this sequence where she was uh, talking and it literally went to silence like we we could you know you could hear the background noise and everything that you hear right when you're in when you're watching a show and then it gradually went to silence and then all you could see was uh, her and her scene partner and they were talking to each other and they were signing to each other in absolute silence and I thought it was brilliant 
And I really, it took me into a moment that I usually don't, because we, whether we don't recognize it, right? They're mimicking what we have outside. They mimic. So we'll hear a siren. We're, if, you know, in the pa, in the in the distance, we'll hear the birds chirping or chirping, or we'll hear like a uh, even some white noise, just because they're they're putting in sound um, to, in those in our everything that we have as background noise. But it was it was a really beautiful moment moments where they actually in that and I remember that scene distinctly where we just it were in silence and it was just the two um actors uh Marley and um her scene partner and I was just like I remember just being captivated by it yeah they do that um in New Amsterdam as well nice yeah. nice I wonder if they learned from the magi magicians yeah I don't know <laughs> I don't know but you know you think about that one scene in Coda where uh, they're on the boat and the, there's like an alarm that goes off and they, you know, neither of them hear it because it just shows how many, you know, and then they, and then they, the, the, I don't know if it, with the, the fishing people, I don't remember what they, what they're, what they yeah. were they on the boat, like, you can't do this anymore. You can't fish anymore. Mm. I mean, can't they make an accommodation? You know, I don't know. Right, you know? right, exactly. I mean, you know, can we get some lights so right, that exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, so yeah. that they can see? And I do think that I mean that was one of the other criticisms the deaf community had uh, that there are more accommodations than sometimes were represented in the movie. You know, so we don't sure. know how accurate sure. that really was, but sure, um, yeah, it's yeah. powerful to think about uh, what it would be like to be deaf by having silence. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And to and it was a moment where they were able to bring us into the conversation, which I think and typically as audience members who are uh, who are hearing, we don't get those moments. And so for them to take the effort to create that I thought was was special and representative. And I'm, I am hopeful. I really am hopeful that this is not just one of those one and done and takes us another 26 years to see yeah. a deaf and hard of hearing talent on stage uh, at, at the academies. Whatever people think about them is their choice, but it is one of the uh, biggest accolades that people can receive in the entertainment industry. And I think that it's important that uh, we see more and more, and I definitely want to see more interpreters. And I mean, there's a whole other conversation about um, people who interpret at concerts you know yeah. and like you're saying the the emotions that they display when they are um when they're out there and uh, the difference the difference in how people sign every day to um, signing at a concert and invoking those emotions through sign language yeah i love watching interpreters yeah, they're amazing. I, I love watching actually concert clips with the interpreters. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> like you're putting on a performance. Yes, yes, totally. Oh, well, I'm so glad you chose Marley. Um, I, I am a huge, huge fan of hers, and I hope to see her in so many things. And like you said, I hope that there's more opportunities for her than uh, than have been. Uh, she has a huge, huge uh, filmography. I mean, she works and she yeah. has been working, yeah, but cool. I want her to be elevated to a much higher standard and definitely get the recognition she deserves for her talent. Yes, I agree. She has... Uh, you know, I was looking at her uh, TV career. I mean, she's on West yeah. Coast, and Fences, ER, Judge Gamey, you know, <laughs> right. uh, SVU, My Name is Earl, the L word, L word, it goes on and on. But, but it's yes. mostly, mostly television. Yes. So it would be good to have her more and her and other deaf actors have more film roles, definitely. Yeah, I mean, her filmography is so big that it has its own separate wiki page, you know, with yes, other talent, yes, yes, right. right? With other talent, it's like at least on the wiki page. But, yeah. you know, you got exceptional people when they have to have their own wiki page. Yes, because right. They have so much in their filmography. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I adore her. And uh, I'm curious, would you want to see like a movie or a miniseries made about her? Totally. That's why I chose her. Yeah. I feel but which like one? A movie or a miniseries? Oh, which, which, which one? Which one? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's some of the streaming platforms are doing such a good job with their little miniseries. Like I just watched uh, the one about Julia Child, mm -hmm. uh, you know, HBO Max. And um, so I think a, a miniseries would be great. Something like that. Uh, because yeah. she, she's done so much. And I really feel like she's, you know, a total trailblazer for mm -hmm. uh, for deaf actors so 
um, yeah, let's go for a mini series. Are you gonna Are you gonna produce it? <laughs> yeah, why not? Right. Uh, I w I would love to be part of that inclusive uh, group of crew and and you know in your readings you might have heard about Coda's uh, director and uh, Sean Hader has has been under scrutiny as well. From everything I've read, for me personally, it's my personal opinion. I do believe that Sean was absolutely wanted to be an advocate and an ally. She really put her time and effort into um, making the movie and made sure that it wasn't filled with hearing talent at all. Um, for everything, like I said, I do feel like this from through and through that the movie was doing its best for where we are today in regards to representation and advocacy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm I'm interested because I agree. I've seen the mixed reviews, uh, for, and definitely from I've been really curious about what the deaf and the hard of hearing community have said, and it's mixed. It's I mean, you know, my arbitrary look at the number of comments from what I've seen, it it almost feels like it's fifty fifty, uh -huh. uh, from people that are uh, deaf and hard of hearing to those that are hearing. It's a uh, and not the movie is bad in terms of its representation. Right, exactly. And sometimes it takes a little while for uh, for those conversations to be had. And actually, you know, before we started filming, I was we were talking about the Viola Davis uh, memoir that I'm reading and listening to. And that was another is another interesting thing when she made the help, you know, yeah. she, yep. uh, you know, she got a lot of criticism at the time, but she was defending defending her role. Well, now she regrets making it, you know, yep. like, yeah. Yeah, it's progress and we'll continue learning and I want to see more iterations of CODA and many different movies and learn about the culture and understand and see them, you know, at these at these awards and 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 uh, I just absolutely like I said I absolutely adore Marley, I think she is just absolutely phenomenal and this amazing, amazing career. I'm so glad we got to talk a little bit. I got to learn a little bit more about her and her life. And I'm looking forward to see more of her and uh, many, many other iterations of uh, deaf and hard of hearing talent that's going to be on screen and so many different genres like marvel is going to have their first deaf uh, live action which oh, um, really? uh, i didn't know that yeah, oh. yeah echo yeah echo uh so it, it, i'm hoping that we see more and it's just not a fad because unfortunately that's what happens people kind of jump jump on a jam uh, bandwagon for a little bit and then they're they're done yeah i agree yeah, which is unfortunate. Thank you so much, Marie. I am so excited we got to talk about such a wonderful talent. And I appreciate you. And I know you do so much great work in language as well as communication. So how can our audience find out more about you? Yeah, my, my website is www.fertilegroundcommunications.com. And I am on all the socials under Fertile Ground Communications or my name, Marie Gettle Gilmartin. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Marley's memoir now. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Marie. Thank you, Ash. Thanks again for being here. And again, if you're liking these episodes, feel free to leave a review, download, comment, and share. And always remember, if I can support you in making our media more inclusive, feel free to reach out. I'm a screenwriter, podcast host, and an author. And I'm at theinclusivescreenwriter.com or the Inclusive Screenwriter on Twitter and Instagram.